on Bob Mollich. Thanks very much, John. Thanks for John and Julie for organizing a, a great session. So uh, this is a two-part talk. Uh, Kevin Walker is following up with, uh, with part two in a moment. Uh, there are slides for both parts online, and there's a paper. Um, the paper comes with a big warning on the front page that it's a draft, it's not actually a real paper yet, but you're welcome to read it if you like. Um, the warning at the beginning points out the places you shouldn't get, things like that. Okay, um, let's get started. Um, I saw this awesome quote in the last AMS notices from a, an interview with, uh, with Yuri Menin from, from a year ago. Uh, you should read that. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, okay, uh, there's the quote. Uh, let me start telling you about this gadget, Robin. So it's actually that we build a complex first. So what is, what is the, the blob complex? It's a gadget where you feed in an n-manifold n and an n category with strong duality. I'll come back to that in a moment. C, and it produces a chain complex, the, the blobs on m with coefficients in C. And what I'm going to tell you first is not actually the definition of the complex, but a bunch of special cases of, the, of, of what you get from the blob complex that will convince you that this thing we're doing uh, is um, well, it's connected to lots of other bits of mathematics that you already know about. It's a common generalization. So the first one, well, I guess yeah, this is the first one. Okay, so we can take, this is the blob complex, and we can take the homology, and now we can just look at the zeroth graded piece of the homology. And I want to say that this is the usual TQFT Hilbert space associated to that manifold M and that N category C. I'll say that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Specializing in a different direction, we can just look at the N equals 1 case. So now we might as well look at the, the circle, our, our manifold, and our N category is just uh, an associative algebra, or, or, an, or an algebra if you really want to have multiple objects. And the homology of the blob complex in that case recovers exactly the Hochschild homology of that associative algebra. So that's already two quite different directions. Um, and there's a third direction which I'm not going to say anything about in this talk, but uh, you can plug in, uh, you can think of a commutative algebra such as polynomials in one variable as an n category in a sort of trivial way. And when you do that, so we're just putting in a really boring n category, uh, you can recover some topological information about the manifolds, in particular the homology of the blob complex there, fix up the singular homology of the infinite configuration space of the, of the original manifold. And there are a few variations of this, polynomials of multiple variables, and you allow inverses, and so on, and you get various other things down this line. Okay. So the input for the blob complex is a manifold and an n category with strong duality. And having seen your guys' reaction to, to Chris's talk, I know that this is a very dangerous thing to say, because you're all well aware that n categories are a dangerous ground. And so happily, the division of labor that Kevin and I agreed upon this afternoon is that I get to pretend that n categories are nice and easy and straightforward and everyone knows exactly what they are. And he's going to tell you the actual definition that we're using in all of this. And you get to pepper him with the difficult questions about Morse theory and weak identities and all of that stuff. And he's going to catch a bus and leave town. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. So Kevin's talk, part two, will explain uh, this crazy notion of a topological n category. Um, it's, uh, in particular, this definition has duality built in, very, very centrally in the definition. You can't talk about this notion of n-category without having duals uh, at, at all the different levels. And he's also going to tell you a little, about, a little bit about an a-infinity version of these n-categories. Just like you can go from associative algebras to infinity algebras to infinity versions of all of this. Um, well, okay, I'm giving all this stuff, so I won't bother going into anything more about n-categories. From now on, and nice and easy and well on Okay. In particular, actually, you should just think about, for the rest of what I say, pivotal two categories where everything is nice and safe. So let me remind you what a pasty diagram is. Uh, a pasty diagram on a manifold is just that you say we're thinking about some model of categories like what Chris was talking about, where we have bihedrons and, uh, and higher dimensional versions of those. You slice up your manifold into a big collection of those glued together, and then you label all of those pieces of the manifold by a morphism from the category. So that's a pasty diagram on some manifold for a given category. And uh, I'm going to start using the word field on M to just mean a pasty diagram on M in some fixed category. 
And I always assume that the top level of morphisms uh, form vector spaces. So I'm going to always be, let myself talk about linear combinations of fields where I'm implicitly thinking that these pacing diagrams are multilinear in all the top dimensional cells. Okay, so here's an example. Um, we can look at the template of the category, which is a, a lovely two category. Uh, and here's an example of a field on the torus. We've chopped it up into pieces. Don't worry too much that these are squares, not bihedrons. Uh, you should be agnostic about shapes for, for right now. And in each one of these pieces that is, that is locally just a ball, we've drawn some morphism from the template of and the whole thing is a, is a field. Okay. Now, pasting diagrams on balls, we can say something special about. Um, in particular, if you have a pasting diagram on a ball, you can do all the compositions uh, and just get a single morphism on that ball. So in particular, that's a map from pasting diagrams on the balls to just morphisms. And we can think about the kernel. So here's an example of something in the kernel. In this example, this is a ball divided into two parts, and each part is some morphism from Temple V. And I claim that these both evaluate to the same thing, the same morphism in temporary leave, just because this is just a single piece of string in temporary leave, and temporary leave is a circle is called the D, and so if we divide by it, these two things exist. Okay. So we'll call linear combinations of pasting diagrams that evaluate to a, a zero morphism a null field on a, on a, on a, on a, on a ball. But that's so this is something that we can only talk about the balls. Okay. So with that all said, here's a little bit of background on, on TQFT invariants from a slightly uh, unusual perspective. So a, a decapitated n plus 1 dimensional TQFT is something that associates a vector space to each n-manifold. And I say decapitated here because it's something that well, if you don't expect to give numerical invariants of manifolds one dimension up. The top level of it is the vector space. And you can... Uh, well, uh, let's see. Uh, let me maybe not say these things in the middle of you, but read them if you feel like it, and just jump to the bottom uh, and tell you how, in this setting, you, you, you expect to get a TQFT from an N category. You just look at the collection of all fields on your manifold, and then you, that's a gigantic vector space, but now we put it down by any field where inside some ball, you see something that's in the kernel of this evaluation map, something that locally ought to be zero in the category. Okay, and from this perspective of, of, uh, of uh, <coughs> well, associating TQFTs to n categories, you get a, a fully extended TQFT that can associate something to every co-dimension manifold, and in particular, it associates to the point of the original n category that you get there. Okay, so now let's start talking about the block complex itself. The idea is that we want to produce some complex so that when we look at just a ball, this complex is like a resolution of uh, the, the TQFT invariant of, uh, of the ball. That is, the homology should all be concentrated in degree zero there, and it should just look like the morphisms of the category. Okay? So here's, well, okay, so that's part of the motivation for how we'd like the block complex to look. Uh, it should be something local and, and uh, and, uh, so that we can define it uh, on arbitrary manifolds, but only by ever thinking about things locally. And um, this is pretty much where you have to start. So the, the zeroth graded piece of the blob complex is just arbitrary fields on a manifold. Again, this is a big giant vector space. The first bit of the blob complex then are linear combinations of triples like this, B, U, and R. B is just some choice of a ball embedded somewhere in the manifold. U is a field on that ball that is in the kernel of the evaluation map. I mean, R is just any old field in the, the complement of that ball. The differential then is just forget about the ball and paste U and R together to form a big pasting diagram on the entire manifold. It's easy to see that uh, the, the quotient of B0 by the image of, of B1, or the image of this first differential here, is just what we said the, the TQFT invariant is meant to be. Just fields what things that are, the, that are locally in the kernel have something in the kernel of the value. So now, to do all the higher bits of the, the blob complex, pretty much we just do whatever we need to do to kill off any, any other homology that would turn up uh, when we do this on the ball. 
So you think about what's in the kernel of D1 now and just add more stuff in B2 that kills that up. So let's see what that turns out to look like. Here's B2. Uh, it's a direct sum of two pieces, the, the disjoint piece and the nested piece. The, the disjoint piece, the second, uh, the second piece of the block complex, looks like this. It's linear combinations of, uh, I guess, quintuples here. It's a choice of two disjoint balls inside the manifold. A null field on each one of those balls, and an arbitrary field on the complement of the balls. The differential here is just a sum over ways of forgetting one of the balls and pasting together the the other appropriate pieces. So in the first term here, we forget the ball B1, and so now the the, uh, the field on the complement of the ball that survives is just this null field B1 put together with R. And the other term, we forget B2, basically, the other things together. The other part of, uh, of B2 is the B2 nested. It's almost identical. Here we have two nested balls. The conditions here is that the innermost label here has to be a null field. The label on the annular region between the two balls can just be an arbitrary pasted diagram in that region, and then there's an arbitrary field on the outside. And again, the differential is the same. It's a sum over ways of, uh, of forgetting uh, a ball. The, the one thing to notice here is that in uh, this term, yeah, this term, where we've um, uh, forgotten the inner ball, this composition you composed with R prime is still a null field because inside some smaller ball it was a null field. And so obviously any time you take a null field you can add more stuff on. You know. Okay, so the last bit of the definition you can probably guess from those pieces. Uh, we allow an arbitrary tree of k balls embedded in the, in the manifold which are either uh, pairwise disjoint or pairwise nested and we label everything in sight by a field, and any innermost ball we label by a null field. So the basic diagram that evaluates to, to zero in the catalog. The differential is just sum of the ways of erasing one of the blocks. Okay, that was the definition. And if you weren't scared by the end category part of it, then it's a very, very simple and straightforward definition. Let's now talk a little bit about the nice properties that it has. So this first slide on, on properties is just telling you a little bit more detail about something I said before, that when you just plug in a circle, it specializes to, to Hochschild homology. So this is just reminding you a little bit about uh, that setting. If you look at the a TQFT invariant on a circle, well, uh, let's, uh, our, our pasting diagrams for some associated algebra A, we might just think of as some dots on a one manifold, with each dot labeled by an element of the, the uh, the algebra. And so the TQFT invariant should be called this all fields on the circle. So put down a bunch of dots, however many you like, label balance the algebra. But then you mod out by things that evaluate to zero. And uh, well, this is most of the things that evaluate to zero. You can take a little interval, two dots labeled by two different things. Uh, or look at the another picture with a single dot labeled by the bottom that evaluate the same thing. You could also look at just differences of, uh, of intervals with points in different places that would be the same. So it's easy to see that this quotient here is just co-invariance of the original algebra A because you can always combine all of your dots together but you can always take a product, AB, put it on one dot at the top and move the B around the circle to the other side. So this is the usual security. Uh, on the other hand, well, the Hochschild complex is the, uh, the derived version of co-invariance. You uh, pick a projective resolution of A as an AA binomial and make a co-invariance of that. And there's one explicit way to write down that uh, the, the derived version of co-invariance. And uh, you can go and read a pretty icky proof in our graph explaining uh, the Hochschild complex on that A is quasi-isomorphic to the blob complex on the circle. And it's sort of a, it's a little bit of an unpleasant proof because it doesn't explicitly show you a map and then show that it's a, a quasi-isomorphism. It shows that both constructions have the same set of universal properties, so they must agree. Uh, what I've drawn here, though, is just a little bit of well, sort of the, low, the lowest degree of the map, or the second lowest degree of the map. Yeah. So uh, what do you send uh, this to? Well, this is the, the zeroth graded piece of the Hochschild complex. You send that just to a circle with a single dot labeled by the number of A. 
of what you send uh, A tensor A to, where you send it to a sum of two blobs. So this is a little diagram. This is meant to represent one blob diagram. This is meant to represent another blob diagram. So we have U1 and U2, and the, the blue things here are the actual blobs. Uh, outside of the, the blobs that are not here, there are no labels. The pasting diagram is just empty. What's inside U1, we take MA and uh, move A halfway around the circle, and in U2, we move A around the other half of the circle. Those are, these are both null fields, they both evaluate to zero, and you can see that the, um, well, the, um, the boundary of some of these two blobs gives exactly the same thing as the, as, uh, as the differential over in the null fields. That's just the lowest degree of value. What's another nice property? Well, so there's a, we expect on a, on a, for a TQFT invariant that homeomorphisms of the manifold act on these vector spaces that we associate with the manifold just because uh, you can push around these pasting diagrams by homeomorphisms. If we get something better on the blob complex, which is that there's a, a chain map from the tensor product of singular chains on homeomorphisms of the manifold with the blob complex to the blob complex. So you should think of this as, say, if you're looking on a, a blob complex on a torus and you look at some rational slope on the torus, that gives you a, a degree one raising operator on the blob complex, because the, 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 the homological degrees here add to something, a one parameter family homomorphisms into something that, that makes it degrees in the blob complex. Oh, and there are some, there are some nice properties of, uh, of this map that it's associated with homotopy in uh, Compatible with putting manifolds together. Um, so, Kevin wanted me to, to mention this, um, which is a, in fact, only a very slight generalization of what was on the previous slide in some sense. Uh, so, there's this thing called the, the Deleen conjecture, which roughly says that, uh, that uh, singular chains of the little disks operator acts on Hochschild's co So, uh, we can restate that slightly and then generalize it to, to arbitrary dimensions. So what I want you to, oh, geez, this slide is really not in the right order. Um, okay, well, uh, you'll have to just ignore this infinity here because uh, maybe can't be, I can't really explain it without Kevin's without talk coming first. But okay, basically if we have, uh, um, some manifold M, and I want you to think of an interval here. Uh, let's call blob cochains on M uh, some sort of homes from the, the complex associated to, to M to the complex associated to M. And this is meant to be something like where the usual blob complex is like what's your homology, this is like the first. And so what we would like to say is that chains on the n-dimensional fat graph operad act on blob cochains. So it's a fat graph, or well, a single fat graph is what you see here. Uh, it has, on the outside, uh, an incoming manifold, M3, M3, and an outgoing manifold, M3. And at various steps along the way, we cut out a piece M0 and paste back in a piece N0. So it's like doing a whole sequence of surgeries. We cut out one piece of the manifold and stick back in another piece. Okay? So that's a fat graph. Uh, and <coughs> Whenever you have uh, an element of one of the, well, if you have a blob cochain for, uh, well, say going from the blob complex of M0 to the blob complex of N0, there's a way of composing them according to a, a factor. And now, uh, when you allow singular chains on this uh, collection of operations that we have in <coughs> by fat graphs, you can also uh, have singular chains on this operator act on, on the, the blob cochains uh, in a very similar way that we have chains of homeomorphisms acting on the blob What's Careful. that little asterisk next to the theorem? Well, okay. <laughs> so if you go and, so, so if you go and uh, read uh, the, the draft that's online at the moment, uh, the, the, the proof of this theorem is about three lines long or 20 lines long and ends with a dot dot dot. And um, <laughs> I think I would have to say that, that Kevin is much more confident in knowing how to write down what comes after the dot 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 than I am. And since I'm the one giving this talk, I found an asterisk. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my deal. But Kevin, Kevin might not feel any need to put an asterisk if he was saying the same slide. <laughs> 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 
Well, yeah, I put the asterisk so that someone like you would ask. Um, okay, and I better finish up. Um, a final nice formal property of the, the blob complex is that it's a gluing formula. You can compute the blob complex for a big manifold knowing the blob complexes for the smaller pieces. So the idea here is that if you have a manifold which is just some coding in one manifold cross I, that blob complex naturally has the structure of an A infinity category, roughly given by gluing intervals n to n and reparameterizing intervals after you group. Now, if you have uh, a co-dimension one manifold y sitting inside the boundary of, of some manifold x, that tells you that the blob complex for x becomes an A infinity module over this A infinity category coming from y cross i. And the, the gluing formula tells you that if you have x with two copies of y sitting in the boundary, you can compute the blob homology of the manifold you get by gluing together the two copies of y by taking an A infinity tensor product. Well, I mean, since there are two copies of y in the boundary, the blob complex of x is a bimodule over this A infinity category, and we can take the self, the self A infinity tensor product of that bimodule, and that computes the blob complex of the, uh, the gluing together thing. And what that actually turns into in practice is uh, telling you how to compute uh, blob complexes uh, by well, iterated popular homologies. It might not look, to, look like it at first, but self A infinity tensor products are very much like taking uh, taking popular homologies and more fine And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Sort of be very different. So, and you can just go ahead and not. Oh, yeah, I'm questions. So here you have D star of Y equals zero, 1, but then over there it says module over. Oh, okay. Of that, that was me being sloppy. I, I'm sort of implicitly saying, like, whenever you want to look at code image and manifold, code image, some code image and manifold across with the ball. Um, so, in particular, like I've said here, that Y across the integral is an infinity category. Kevin will tell you that uh, if you have a coding with K manifold, the blob complex of uh, Y across the, the K ball is naturally in A infinity K category. That's in particular the, the blob complex of a point is some sort of A infinity version of the original point category that you put into the blob complex of the The reason I'm asking that question is the topological logic four manifold uh, certainly has uh, the disk charts covering it, but it isn't formed by taking four cells and doing them oh, the one boundary. Um, yeah, um, it just seemed like gluing things along, you know, compact boundary was easier and every other one would be the other way, but I think you know, maybe that works too. Just, uh, <clears throat> I was wondering how the fat graph worked around as a generalization of the little disco graph. Oh, well, I mean, it's maybe not. It just comes up all those manifolds as instruments. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're all it's, a, it's a little bygone. It's a little bygone opera, I mean, and if, if everything here is just an interval. And uh, then it's something very close to little disks. Oh, I think some top equivalent, I think, in the case where all the manifolds are nice. So with the blob homology of M is, I mean, it's, it's like the M Hochschild homology of, M, of what your category. Um, and, yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering if there are things you can compute with this presentation of that. But uh, I mean, are there particular things you want to compute that, that are in, you have in mind as examples? Oh, okay. So um, I, yeah, I guess I didn't say anything about the motivation for uh, the blob homology in the first place. But the, the, the rough idea is that uh, the, the TQFT construction where you just take all fields on your manifold and push it out by things that are 
for the locally held fields um, isn't, to the, isn't an exact fund because uh, say, say, we, say we want to look at um, uh, the T of T invariant for some manifold with some specified boundary conditions and we have some maps that modify the boundary conditions and we, the, and we, on the level of fields we, these maps were, were exact. Uh, when you go to the TQFT construction, then you expect exactness to break just because you're taking a conclusion. So the idea here is that this is a, a derived version of the TQFT construction. So for example, uh, for either, in either context topology or Kavanaugh homology, you can define either a three category or, four, or a four category, uh, where you would, you would like to produce invariants of three manifolds and four manifolds. But say in the Kavanaugh homology case, what you would like is a and variant of four manifolds with boundary, where in the boundary there's some link. The usual way that you compute your boundary homology is by using the fact that you have a, a long exact sequence relating the Kavano homologies of a link with a crossing like this and the link with the, the two resolutions. But if you're doing the obvious thing for uh, a link in the boundary of some other four manifold other than the four wall, you don't expect that exact sequence to hold for the, the same modules in it another format. And so the hope is that uh, since this is the, the derived version, knowing the full blob complexes for two of those links, you might be able to compute the, the blob complex or at least maybe only in the zeroth graded part of the blob complex for the third piece. So it's sort of intended as a saving exactness. And some, some nice examples of three and four categories that aren't semi simple that we to More questions? Okay, thanks.